Hello and uh, welcome uh, to the daily cricket show, Cricket Happenings. Uh, well, on this uh, particular uh, cricket show, uh, I'm going to talk about how, uh, you know, West uh, Zimbabwe, I thought, still did a good job uh, of reaching 316 and in the end, uh, winning, uh, losing the test match against the West Indies on the fourth day by 129 runs but uh, it was I, one, one knew that the writing was on the wall but uh, it was a matter of the resistance that Zimbabwe really gave uh, that is what was very very creditable which I'll be uh, talking about um, and other than that there is the second uh, so the the second one day international starting between India and New Zealand uh, is of much importance to India because if at all they allow New Zealand to win the second one day year, uh, New Zealand would have taken the one day series. So New Zealand India would be pretty much aware about it. So I'll be doing a brief preview of that match. <laughs> but first, I'm going to start off with the uh, West Indies versus Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe match. Today was the four days play as uh, the, both the opening batsmen, Hamilton Masakanja and Solomon Maher, resumed their innings. Hamilton Masakanja... As you know, he plays the pull shot very well, so it definitely took um, good effect. He really played the pull shot very well, and there was a good partnership that was going on, which had almost reached 100 mark. They had put on 99 runs for the first, uh, first wicket, with Hamilton Masakarja and Solomon Maher uh, playing on uh, very well. Solomon Maher uh, definitely with his uh, dabs and steers through the a slip and gully. Corden was collecting grants. Masakaja, on the other hand, was dealing with the short stuff very well by uh, pulling it for boundaries. <coughs> and things were just going on. And uh, Zimbabwe uh, had gathered 99 runs. I mean, they had put a 99 run partnership. And then finally, the first wicket uh, fell for Zimbabwe when Brathwaite actually uh, had uh, Masakaja scalped by Shai Hope. Yeah, I'm uh, Shai Hope uh, for 57 with 10 boundaries. So that was wicket number one. Craig Irvine came in uh, and uh, we saw the ball was turning but uh, before Craig Irvine um, just came in and joined Solomon Meyer and then Kemar Roche uh, went on to um, uh, uproot the stumps of Solomon Meyer by getting him clean ball for 47 with 7 boundaries. <laughs> After that we saw the Brendan Taylor, the former captain, come out uh, and join Craig Irvine, but Craig Irvine could not last long. Uh, he was LBW bowled Devendra Bishu for 18 with three boundaries, but Brendan Taylor was there at the crease as Sean Williams came in uh, to, to bat. But Sean Williams also could not last much as he decided to take on Devendra Bishu, the right arm leggy, and in the process uh, found that he was stumped by Dowridge behind the stumps for six uh, with one boundary. But Brendan Taylor was joined in by Sikandar Raja and then a partnership, a small partnership started. But Sikandar Raja definitely uh, was under some very good company of Brendan Taylor. And Brendan Taylor was playing those trademark shots of his and especially the uppercut that he plays very well as you all know. And he was uh, doing his job uh, very well, <coughs> slowly uh, taking on the West Indian bowlers. Sikandar Raja... Uh, was also trying to look solid at the crease and uh, this particular partnership uh, had uh, taken the score uh, to uh, 64 runs were added uh, for the fifth wicket and then finally the wicket fell it was of Sikandar Raza when Chase actually uh, Bishu actually had him uh, caught uh, very well by Chase for 30 with two fours and one six <coughs> after that Malcolm Waller. Now, Malcolm Waller, unfortunately, uh, was run out by a shy hope direct hit for 11 with two boundaries, and that was a blow as well. Because Brendan Taylor, on the other hand, was uh, still going on strong at that end. And then Chakabwa uh, gave a tame return catch to Austin Chase, and he was gone for one. Uh, and then Creamer was caught and bowled by Bishu for nine. Uh, so once Creamer went, one knew that it was only a matter of time. But Brendan Taylor's wicket was very important. Brendan Taylor was still there at the wicket, but then a very, very silly run out that happened, which really closed the game for Zimbabwe as uh, Brendan Taylor was run out by a Dowdich-Brathwaite combination 
but so Brendan Taylor would be happy with this effort after uh, coming back to the Zimbabwean team. He really showed uh, that he was the highest scorer today with 73 with eight fours. And then, uh, and one thought that uh, it was only a matter of time where West Indies will be actually wrapping up the innings. Uh, the score at 263 for nine when Creamer fell, but one never thought that there would be some real indulgence on the part of Kyle Jarvis and Pofu as both uh, really, especially Pofu, was slamming the ball all across the park. Jarvis was giving him company and this partnership was frustrating the West Indies as um, even though there was nothing alarming to really uh, talk about, but uh, what it did is it kept the West Indians on the field and there was a, a 10th wicket partnership of 50 runs between Jarvis and Pofu. Chris Pofu got his, um, got his, um, uh, his uh, highest uh, test score as uh, he, cl he clubbed 33 of 25 deliveries, four fours and one six. And then finally Chase was the one who picked up his wicket uh, with Jarvis uh, remaining not out on 23 with three boundaries. And finally the game was over, 316 all out and West Indies taking a 1-0 lead uh, in the in the two match series uh, by winning by 129 runs. Now, as far as the bowling was concerned, <coughs> Kemar Roche, 13 overs, three minutes, one for 34 bowled well. Gabriel Tenno was two minutes, one for 50. Holder fell over for none for 30. And Devendra Bishu was expected. He took a nine wicket bag in the match, 32 overs, eight minutes, 105 runs, and four wickets. Roston Chase, 13.4 overs, two minutes, 261. Bradway Tenno was one minute, one for 30. And the man of the match going to Devendra Bishu. Uh, for his exploits with the ball and one has to say I think even though uh, Zimbabwe lost this match I have to say uh, that Zimbabwe need to be commended because this was not an easy pitch to bat on the ball was turning and um, probably I wouldn't say ever so slowly but definitely there was a bit of kicking too on the fourth day so definitely one has to uh, say that the Zimbabwean batsman negotiated the spin of Bishu very well and uh, uh, and uh, it was it was good to see that Zimbabwe really gave a good fight uh, because if if you look at the margin, one would say 129 runs is a big margin, but one one never thought that you know <coughs> that Zimbabwe will uh, go to this extent, but they definitely did. So I have to say that you know I have to watch my words when speaking because yesterday, as I said, I said it's a foregone conclusion that West Indies will win the match. Yes, they definitely won. But uh, I have to definitely say that Zimbabwe put up a very, very good fight. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I, I think they deserve a due commendation uh, for uh, the way they played today. But anyways, so that is over. So the first of the two test series starting off with a West, with an West Indian win. And West Indies will be pretty happy about that. So let's have a look at the, uh, as I said, the second ODI, which is coming up tomorrow at the Pune Cricket Ground. And it's going to be played with India and New Zealand. And as I already told you, the pressure is on India, which has rarely happened where, as you know, it's a three-match ODI series and we have the decider coming up. So, as I said, if India does not win the second one, the international, it would be curtains for them. So, letting, uh, looking at the Indian squad, <coughs> now Rohit Sharma will definitely have a battle uh, against the bowling of Trent Bolt. And all the Indian batsmen too, I think. Uh, they, they need to really play Trent Bolt in a better manner. And Rohit Sharma especially uh, has been having a real struggle against left-arm pace ball, especially the ball uh, which is actually coming in, the in-dipper. And I'm sure Rohit Sharma might have taken some lessons, probably looked at the videos and see how he can actually iron his technique uh, against the in-dippers uh, which, uh, which are coming in from the left-arm pace ballers because he does have a fallibility to fall against this Indipers, which we saw it in the previous one-day international against Trent Bolt as well. Uh, Shikhar Dhawan uh, will be expected to score a bit of run, bit, uh, bit runs here. Virat Kohli is uh, coming uh, on great confidence with this uh, century that he had. Uh, Dinesh Karthik, uh, uh, when he's told that uh, Dinesh Karthik will be elevated the batting order, he will get to bat at number four <coughs> because of the way he played in the first ODI. Kedar Jadav. Uh, is slotted at uh, number five uh, and then they have Dhoni coming in, uh, Hardik Pandya and the bowling will be definitely in the hands of Bhunesh Sharkumar and Jasprit Bumbra and then the rest is per spinner, Skuldeep Yadav and New Zealand the child take over. Uh, as far as um, as far as uh, New Zealand is concerned, uh, I have to say that uh, they, they definitely the experiment 
of getting some oomph at the top by thrusting in Colin Munro to open the innings definitely had an effect, I would say, because psychologically, if, uh, if, uh, if a lot of uh, biffing is done over the top in the initial play, power play overs, it really helps the uh, team. And Colin Munro has done exactly that. So he would be expected to score a f few more runs uh, in the second one day. Uh, Kane Williamson <coughs> failed, but you know he's such a great uh, player uh, who can who won't be consistently failing for sure. Uh, Ross Taylor, yes, we all know that Tom Latham uh, got a century under his belt in the very first ODI. Ross Taylor also came close to a century, so they are in good nick. And then Henry Nichols, Colin Degan, whom the all rounder Mitchell Santner did a good job with the ball. And again, the challenge for an Indian batsman would be against Trent Bolt, the left-arm pace bowler. And Tim Sadi was a bit costly. Probably he might have to work on, the, on, the, on his line as well. So this is what... Uh, um, and one would... Uh, uh, and one knows that uh, the Pune cricket ground... I'm just trying to see how the conditions there. Um, I'm, I'm told we might have a lot of runs scored uh, because uh, the, the, there are short boundaries in Pune. So basically one can say... Uh, that we might have a run feast here uh, at Pune. So it would be interesting to see as to what really uh, comes up uh, in this uh, second ODA one day uh, between India and New Zealand at the Pune Cricket Ground. Now now to some cricket news, uh, dear fans. Uh, as far as cricket news is concerned, um, uh, the IPL, um, as you know, in 2018, it says that they could retain three players. So every team can retain at least three players in their, uh, in their mix. Uh, other than that, uh, I can say Duplessis is out of international cricket for six weeks. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to see whether there is any other uh, cricket news that I could share with you, dear fans, friends and subscribers. Yes, I, I definitely need to uh, speak about uh, one particular record uh, which was broken in New Zealand. Uh, and this is something uh, that was something unique. Uh, Michael Paps, as you know, uh, has become uh, the, I mean, Michael Paps uh, had the, uh, I mean, he's the oldest triple C, he's 38 years of age, Michael Paps. And uh, looking at the stats here uh, as to people who have scored um, a triple centuries uh, at the age of uh, 35 and above, we have a few names here in the year uh, 2000, I'll go by 1990. In 1990, uh, at 36 years, uh, Stephen Cook scored 313 against Somerset. Uh, and in the same year, we saw the England player Graham Gooch uh, score 333 against India, I reckon. Uh, um, uh, 333, that was it. And then in the year 2006, Mark Ram Prakash of England scored 301 uh, for Surrey. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and then a Zimbabwean batsman, he was Zimbabwe, but he was playing for Sussex. He, he has the highest score at the age of 36 years, 344. But, uh, uh, I mean, whatever I said now, right now, <coughs> all these records were really put into the shade uh, by a batsman from New Zealand. His name was Michael Paps. It was a game which was being played. It's a local game which was being played between Wellington and Canterbury, I suppose. Uh, Wellington against Auckland uh, and uh, at the age of 38 I mean Gooch was 37 so Michael Paps was just 38 years of age I mean he was 38 years of age at the age of 38 just scored a triple century which was 316 and then he was scored um, he scored it for Wellington against Auckland in the Plunkett Shield which is the local tournament there uh, in and he's also the oldest among uh, New Zealand cricketers uh, to actually do so. So <laughs> definitely, uh, if you look at um, the triple centurions in first class cricket, uh, there are some big names coming from Grace, Hendren, uh, Grace, um, Grace Hendren, uh, Hobbs, Jack Hobbs, R. Abel, or A.W. Nurse, Sandham. Uh, then we have uh, Holmes, Paps now, uh, Herbert Sutcliffe, a great player, Graham Gooch. Uh, but the highest scorer of a triple century uh, stands in the name of R. Abel uh, of, uh, for Surrey against Somerset. Uh, he was 41 years of age uh, when he sh scored that century. So, so these are some, um, this is some cricket news that I wanted to uh, share. And I'm also told um, uh, it was uh, 
uh, they also broke uh, uh, the highest first wicket stand um, the highest opening stand in uh, first week in uh, first wicket stand in first class matches in New Zealand the previous one was uh, set by 428 runs for the opening wicket between Peter Ingram and Jamie Hoffa Central Districts against Wellington and that partnership and that uh, record was broken today by four runs so 432 runs partnership happened between the triple century and Michael Paps and Luke Woodcock and it was the highest opening stand in first class matches in New Zealand and the second highest for any wicket in um, in uh, Pl Plunkett, uh, Pl Plunkett history, Plunkett Shield, as you know, it's called Plunkett Shield history. And uh, well, one has to really say uh, that at the age of 38 to come and score a double century uh, is not an easy thing at all. So definitely Michael Paps uh, deserves all the credit uh, that he has to get uh, for doing so. Well, dear fans, uh, so today I don't have any other news to really share. <coughs> it's about time for me. Uh, to pull the curtain down on this uh, daily cricket show of mine today by bidding you all a very good night.